This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. On the eve of Halloween, two intriguing ghost stories on unsolved mysteries. In its heyday, the old St. James Hotel in New Mexico was host to a long list of legendary gunslingers and outlaws. Today, employees report different kinds of guests, unearthly visitors that never check out. For years, June Ferris dreamed of a strange house that she had never seen or even been in. Later, she found herself living in that same house where years before the previous owner had been murdered. She and her family believe that his spirit is still there. We'll also profile the baffling case of Marianne Perez, who vanished without a trace in 1976. 15 years later, an anonymous caller contacted her family, claiming that not only was Marianne still alive, but she was being held captive against her will. And authorities need your help to track down a clever and corpulent con man who masquerades as a bona fide physician and hoodwinks even the most sophisticated of victims. Call him Dr. Fraud. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Or perhaps you may encounter one that simply cannot be explained. a one night each year which seems to bring out the wide-eyed child in all of us, Halloween. As darkness falls, our imaginations take flight. Houses begin to whisper and creak. Shadows come to life. The sky fills with ghosts and goblins. But in Cimarron, New Mexico, Halloween is an everyday occurrence at the old St. James Hotel, which some say is haunted by the spirits of the Wild West. When I bought the hotel, I didn't believe in ghosts at all. Uh, now, after the convincing evidence of the last five years, I'm certain that there are ghosts here. They are indeed real to me. They are not something that I've made up. They are indeed in this hotel. The ghosts are here. Are they haunting it? No, I think they're just living here. There are places where the emotions have been very strong. And it's something like the energy gets captured or caught. And this hotel is certainly one of them. In its heyday, the St. James Hotel offered good food, attractive dancing girls, and comfortable beds for such wild and woolly guests as Jesse James, Matt Masterson, Annie Oakley, Doc Holliday, and Wyatt Earp. But as the glory days of the Old West faded, the hotel fell into disrepair. In 1985, Ed Sitzberger and his wife, Pat, purchased the St. James. They planned to bring the old hotel back to life. The Sitzbergers soon discovered that the St. James had a life of its own. I wanted to see how many leaks were in the old hotel, and so I got my friend to come with me and to go through the hotel with her flashlight. We finished doing all the checking and put out some buckets here and there, because we did have some leaks. And then we turned the chandelier off and then went downstairs and out the hotel. And for some reason, I turned back up and looked back up to the second story, and the chandelier was on. I don't believe it. We gotta go back in. Sure, I turned this off. 
when we got out and had locked the door, we looked back up again, and the light was again on. So we went through the hotel again and turned the chandelier off and came back down the stairs and out again, locked the door, looked back up, and it was on. The last time we went up, we went down the hall, and I turned back to John, and I said, well, the former owners had told us about some things that had happened previously in the hotel. Let me just try something. And so before I turned the chandelier off this time, I said, I don't know who you are or why you're here, but I'm tired, and I really don't want to play tonight. I'm glad you're here, but could we please play another day? And at that point, I pulled the cord on the chandelier and heard a click, and we turned around and went back down the stairs. And I looked up, and indeed, the light had stayed off. Right. First, I thought maybe it was an electrical problem because it's an old hotel. But after doing it three or four times, it, it, it couldn't have been. And I could hear it shut off. And the three times that I shut off, the click of the, of the switch. And so there was no reason for it coming back on. According to the Sitzbergers, the hotel is haunted top to bottom. Guests in room 17 have reported a persistent eerie tapping noise whenever the window is open. In the kitchen, the cook has witnessed several bizarre occurrences. And in May of 1988, Charlie Varela, a local high school student, was cleaning the bar at 5 a.m. Charlie thought he was alone. It was kind of dark in there, and I was going to the back to get some liners for the trash. And I was, as I was going back there, I just glanced over to the bar, and I just, I seen a little boy sitting on the bar and spinning the glass. And you can hear it on the tip going, <laughs> spinning and just. Perfectly spinning. At first, you know, I thought it was a little boy from, you know, up and upstairs, and he was just down messing around. You know, I was gonna tell him, you know, excuse me, you're not supposed to be in here. <clears throat> but when <clears throat> when I went to make the move to tell him, he turned around. His face was hideous, and he just jumped off, and it just scared me, and it just. Oh. I quit that morning. I just when I seen that, it scared me and I didn't want to work here anymore. Dr. Kenneth Wright, a surgeon and amateur ghost hunter, heard about the spirits at the St. James and came to investigate. Let's go inside. When Dr. Wright asked me to go into room 18, I was a little skeptical because I had been in there many times before and had felt the chilliness and the negativeness in there. The room was cold. And when I looked up in the upper left-hand corner, there was a whirling that was going on in the corner. You couldn't see the corner of the room. It was like a white swirl. There was this anger and hatred, and instantly I was filled with terror. I was gasping for breath because I had not expected it, did not encounter it. I've never been that terrified in my life. And as this was happening to me, I heard Pat saying, You can go. You're free to go. You can go. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. I don't know what this swirling presence was. It was negative. It was cold. It felt like it was from the past. It, it didn't want me there. That was very obvious. He was angry at her because it was his place, and she was telling him that he was free to leave, and he was telling her you don't tell me I am for This is you will leave. Next, Ed Sitzberger contacted Jackie Littlejohn, a psychic from Albuquerque. Jackie claims to be able to communicate with the spirit world. I was able to sense physical violence or gunshot. It, it was so strong, I... I stepped backwards. I, I could see and feel and smell, and uh, you know the the evidence of violence was so intense. 
During her tour of the hotel, Jackie claims she had a vision of a deadly poker game. The poker game had been going on for a long time, and it was a feeling that either the hotel was at stake or a very large herd. According to Jackie, one of the card players was a man whose ghost now inhabits room 18. He died of blood poisoning. Very slow, very painful, very dreadful. Desperate. Desperate man, very fearful. Jackie says a dead man's name was T.J. Wright and that he probably won the hotel in the poker game just before he was killed. We wanted to look back in the records and corroborate the, the uh, story, so we went back and looked at the, at the hotel register in 1881 and found T.J. Wright registered three different days in 1881. It, it just is reasonable to me that, that uh, he believes he owns the hotel still and wants to maintain possession, or at least live here. Ed Sitzberger keeps the old registry locked in a glass case, and he is certain that Jackie Littlejohn never had access to it. There is, of course, no way to prove that the ghost of T.J. Wright is now haunting room 18, but Ed Sitzberger is not taking any chances. There's no construction activity in that room or renovation work that's going to be done. That's his room as far as I'm concerned as a permanent resident for as long as I have the hotel. Is it truly possible that the St. James Hotel is haunted by the spirits of the Old West? The first-hand accounts you've just heard are definitely difficult to believe. But if you can offer a better explanation for what goes on in the old hotel, the folks at the St. James would certainly like to hear it. When we return, a family in Florida claims that the ghost of a murder victim has returned to haunt the scene of the crime. August 1968. In Richmond, Virginia, a woman named June Ferris is having a disturbing dream about a strange house she has never set foot in or even seen. The dream has plagued her for months. In the dream, I was in an upstairs bedroom, and uh, I would come out of the bedroom, go out into the hallway, I would turn to the right and go down the narrow staircase. I knew the house had a front staircase, but I never used the front staircase in the dream. It was always the back. And I would turn to the left and go through the kitchen, around a refrigerator and stove that were on the one wall. I had a feeling of uh, anxiety, an anxious feeling that something was going to happen that I should know about. And I would go out the kitchen door onto the porch. And that's where I would wake up. And I suppose that uh, this dream continued maybe once a month until we moved to Orlando four years later. June and her family moved to Florida in 1972. Two years later, she was driving through the small town of Claremont, Florida, when she came upon a house that enchanted her. I've always liked old Victorian houses. It was such a lovely home. So I called the realtor and asked if I could go through it. This is great. However did you find this place? I just drove by and the sign was right out front. June returned with a friend for a closer look. Once inside, June began to experience an eerie sensation. We went through the downstairs first and uh, went up the front staircase. 
and I had a feeling of, um, I guess you would say deja vu. I, I had definitely been here before. Oh, look, more stairs. I wonder where they go. I know where they go. They go down, through the kitchen, past the stove, and onto the back porch. How do you know that? I've dreamed about this house. So as we walked through the house, it definitely was the same house of the dream. And I knew every room in the house, every closet, every where everything was. It, it was it was just a real unusual experience. Not scary. Not uh, I didn't feel spooked. It was just it was a good feeling. It was a feeling like I had come home. In March of 1978, June and her husband and three of their children moved into the old house. Almost immediately, odd things began to happen. My father had brought the boat out on the trailer, and the trailer hitch was on a sawhorse-type stand. And it looked as if someone had reached over, picked the trailer hitch up, and just dropped it on the ground. Robin. There was nobody there. I mean, it was blank space. It wasn't like it jumped off. It was like someone had actually lifted it off of the stand and dropped it. And it happened several times again afterwards. It was so fast that you really wanted to think to yourself, did I really see that? Did that really happen? But it was just shock, absolute shock. Over the next few years, the Ferrises were to witness more and ever stranger occurrences. The extraordinary became the ordinary, and the family began to suspect that they were not the only ones living in the house. I was about 20 or 21. It was when my husband David and I were married and we were living in my mother's house. He woke me up in the middle of the night one night. Robin? What's that? Listen. It sounds like my music boxes. He knew that the house was haunted and he was just terrified. But the switches were not on. They were just wound up. And they were playing. All of them were playing. The music boxes coming on really assured me that we definitely had a ghost in that house. And I felt like we did before then. But it just got, it, were, it wasn't scary to me anymore. It was kind of fascinating. Uh, well. In 1985, Bob Vitter began dating June's younger daughter, Lori. I was a firm disbeliever in ghosts, but after everything that's happened to me in that house, there is such a thing as ghosts, and there is a ghost in that house. There was an engine manufacturer's number a couple of nights before Halloween, Laura and I were in the parlor on the couch, and we heard the back screen door slam. Who's that? It's just my mom. Oh. We heard something with boots come through the kitchen. It's not your mom and walk down the hallway and stop in the opening going into the parlor. And I had a feeling that whatever it was was standing right there watching us. And the sound of its boots continued down the hallway and I followed it. And at that point I was really very, very scared. I never encountered anything like that. I was just so terrified I couldn't even move. By now, everyone was convinced that the house was haunted, but no one had actually seen a ghost yet. I was walking up the stairway in the foyer of the house. I felt a cold chill. It's almost like when you open your freezer in the hot summertime. It was very definitely a person, and he was, oh, very early middle age or late 30s. And um, it was just like a vapor, just like a cloud of smoke 
kind of, you know, it's there and then it's gone. But it was very definite. It was very definitely a person. Three months later, Bob Vitter had his own ghostly encounter. I was upstairs preparing to paint. I uh, opened the attic door, and there in front of me was a, a white vapor, almost in the shape of a human. And as I took another step forward, this vapor came at me, and it went right through me. And I felt a cold blast of air and the musty smell that always accompanied the ghost. And as, just as quickly as it went through me, it was over. In October 1985, Bob Vitter began looking into the history of the old mansion. In a local library, he found volumes of old newspapers and was startled to discover an account of a brutal murder in which the owner of the house was gunned down in his own backyard. The victim's name was John Harden. Bob began to believe that if there were a ghost in the house, perhaps it was the ghost of John Harden. Harden grew up in South Florida, and at 18 married his high school sweetheart, Rita. Together, they raised four children in Jacksonville, Florida. Every moment with him was wonderful. He was a good person. He was always caring, not only about his family, but his friends. You know, everybody. He was always a concerned about everyone around him, everyone that touched his life. But after 14 years of marriage, John Harden dropped a bombshell on his wife. He came in from work one afternoon. I love you, you know that. Put his arms around me. He said, I love you. I have to go away. What do you mean? I have to leave for a while. He said, I have some problems. And when I get myself together, I'll be home. But he never came home. Good morning. Good morning. Are you the owner? Yes, I am. About a year and a half later, Hardin remarried. He and his second wife moved to Claremont, where they purchased the old Victorian mansion. Nine months later, John Hardin awoke to a disturbance outside of his bedroom window. Hardin's pickup truck was engulfed in flames. It was later determined that the fire had been deliberately set. Hardin lay mortally wounded, shot once in the chest with a single barrel shotgun. He died less than an hour later. No one was ever arrested in connection with the shooting. Had there been a motive, you know, we could have proceeded with the case investigation a lot better. Uh, there was several things that was brought to our attention, but there uh, was never a firm motive established. We had absolutely nothing after three and a half months of a great deal of travel and, and interviewing literally hundreds of witnesses. We didn't have any more at the end of the three and a half months than we had when we started. On a scale of one to 10, uh, or difficulty of, of solving a, a crime, this is probably about as close to a 10 as I've ever seen. Could John Harden's spirit possibly be haunting his former residence? There do seem to be amazing similarities between the ghost and the man himself. According to his first wife, Harden was a loving and overly protective parent. When our children were little, Johnny would be very concerned about them, always going to the other room to check them, just to be sure they were okay, to be sure they weren't, you know, wrapped up in the covers or, you know, always wanting to be sure that they were all right. Very concerned about them, always. Even as they got older, I was always concerned. The Ferrises believe that the spirit in their house has this same nurturing attitude. Apparently, he was very fond of children and babies because my grandson had an experience with him. He would wake up and see this man standing over his bed, and of course, that would scare the bejeebers out of me. 
and I'm sure it did him. Mom! 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 And it happened several times until Robin went into the room one night before Raymond went to sleep, and uh, she spoke to the ghost. And she said, please do not come back in this room anymore, and please leave Raymond alone. And after that, uh, he didn't come back, or at least if he did, Raymond didn't wake up. When June Ferris learned the details of John Harden's life and death, she recognized a startling connection with a dream which had plagued her for years. When I first learned that John Harden came down the back stairs into the kitchen and out the back door, which was the same path that I took in my dreams, I felt like there was something there that I should know. Maybe if the dream had continued, I would have learned something, that there was a link. And in some way, he's trying to tell us what happened to him and even help us find the killer. I think that he haunts to try to make a point to people that, hey, I'm here, and I can't go anywhere until this is taken care of. In 1990, the Ferrises moved out of the old mansion. The new owners also tell haunting tales of a restless spirit roaming the hallways each night. Curiously, when we filmed at the old Victorian house in Claremont, our production crew encountered a number of unusual difficulties. Lights flickered on and off for no apparent reason. Equipment failed. Doors opened on their own. And a window in the attic shattered. The cause unknown. Perhaps it was just coincidence. Or perhaps it was the spirit of John Harden, unable to rest until justice is served. And the final footnote to this story is apt to give anyone pause. The investigation into the murder of John Harden has now been reopened. Next, an anonymous phone call rekindles a case of a woman who disappeared in 1976. Donna, I gotta get going, Dolan. On March 25, 1976, Mary Ann Perez of Chalmette, Louisiana, said goodbye to her teenage daughter, Donna. Yeah. And would you put everything in the fridge when you're done? Sure. Donna had agreed to babysit her younger brothers and sisters so Mary Ann could go out with one of her girlfriends. All right. I love you. Love I'm going to call and check up on y'all. OK. Lock the doors. Oh, yeah. She told Donna that she would be calling to check on us about 10, 11 o'clock. And Donna said she got a phone call from Mama first. State Mama said that she was OK. She'd be home shortly. And then about 1.30 in the morning, Donna said she got a phone call from a woman by the name of Dorothy. Hello? Hi, my name's Dorothy, and I'm a friend of your mama's. I'm calling to let you know she's having car trouble, so she'll be a little late getting home tonight. Is she OK? She'll be fine. She'll be home soon. Bye. Hello? Hello? When I heard about the call and heard the name Dorothy, I couldn't imagine who in the world that could have been. Uh, I knew there was something wrong somewhere, uh, the car being practically new and no reason for car trouble. Mary Ann Perez never called and never came home. Her family soon discovered that she had gone to meet her friend at a country western club on the outskirts of New Orleans. Ah, uh, cool beer. The next morning, Mary Ann's car was found parked in front of the club. Get out and check it. When got. the New Orleans police inspected the vehicle, they saw no evidence of car trouble. The automobile was in perfect running condition. Three days later, Mary Ann's purse weighted down with a brick was found on Lake Poncha train 10 miles away. There was no trace of Mary Ann Perez. Nine years passed, and Mary Ann's family waited, not knowing whether she was dead or alive. Then in 1985, the New Orleans Police Department dispatched a detective to Wichita, Kansas, to question a man named David Courtney. Courtney, along with his wife, had confessed to a multi-state killing spree. One of their victims seemed to have a lot in common with Mary Ann Perez. Uh, 
um, okay, um, I was going to this bar for a drink, and I saw this woman, and uh, she was heading for her car in the parking lot. Uh, she looked a little tipsy. When I went up to Kansas to interview David Courtney, he told me about the female he abducted in New Orleans. He stated that he was driving down the highway and pulled in a parking lot of a country and western bar. Oh. Oh. Hey, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. Um. You're not driving that car, are you? I gotta, I gotta get home to my kids. Well, look, why don't you let my wife and I take you home? She's right up the road here and uh, picking her up from work. I can't. I can't ask you to do that. I live all the way in Chalmette. Chalmette's no problem for us. We live in Chalmette. It's on the way there. You don't I have, mind? I have no problem at all, you know? I'd feel guilty if I left you here in the shape you're in. Come on in. I probably should. <laughs> so what's your name? Mary Ann. I'm David. Did you pick your wife up? Yeah, and, uh, and, and we took her straight to our trailer. After you got to the trailer, did y'all have sexual advances towards this woman? He stated that this female fell asleep on a chair in the trailer, and there were some sexual advancements by David Courtney's wife, which woke this female up, and she became disturbed and irate and upset about what was going on, and they agreed to give her a ride home at that time. David Courtney stated that his wife drove, and he sat in the back seat with her intended victim. Taking you back, and it's all over. That's all. No problem at all. This is your road, right? I mean, you can see it. Courtney said he had already killed once, and he and his wife were afraid that this woman would go to the police if they let her live. This is it? This is it. You know, hey, baby, we're going on the right road, huh? This is not the way home. This is not. According to David Courtney, he and his wife dumped their victim near the Louisiana-Mississippi state line. Come on! They made absolutely no attempt to hide the body. Detective Lambert was becoming more and more certain that the Courtney's victim had indeed been Mary Ann Perez. I'm going to show you a photograph now. I want you to take a look at it and see whether or not you can identify this person. Um. Could be, yeah, it kind of looks like her. It's a little bit heavy, but I can't be 100% sure, but yeah, I think so, maybe. I'm going to show you a smaller photograph. I want you to look at it and see if you recognize anything in that photograph. Well, yeah, that's her car. It's green. Definitely. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's her car. Detective Lambert next questioned Courtney's Hello. wife, specifically Detective about Mary Ann's purse. Police Department. I spoke with your attorney last night. It's my understanding that you don't wish to... I asked her if the female he abducted had a purse, and she said yes, that she threw it over the side of a bridge that they were crossing at the time. My daddy came into the room, and he got us all together, and he said, um, he said to us, he said, Mama is dead. He said they found the people that did it, and she's dead. She's gone. And it just, it tore us up because we had a lot of hope until that. Get her out, quick. I got it. Based on Courtney's statement, an extensive search was conducted. A body was not recovered, even though all of Courtney's other victims had been found where he said they would be. Courtney's were never charged with Mary Ann's murder. The slim hope that she was alive continued to flicker. Then in 1990, the case of Marianne Perez was resurrected once more. Fifteen years after Marianne's disappearance, the wife of her oldest son, Elwood, received a phone call from a woman who claimed to be Marianne's best friend. She asked to speak with Elwood, and he wasn't home, and I didn't want to tell the stranger that my husband wasn't home. She asked to speak with Elwood again, and I said, well, if you're not going to tell me who you are, I'm not going to let you speak with him. And she said, well, it's about Marianne. And I said, what about Miss Marianne? And she said, well, Miss Marianne's still alive. I'm calling for Marianne because they won't let her call. 
Marianne can't remember. Look, that you have Donna's number. No, I don't know Donna's number. The but caller was emphatic. Was she would not be able to telephone again. Like Marianne, she was not allowed. I'm telling you, Marianne is still alive. I don't understand why you don't want to help her. That uh, caused me to think, you know, more positive that she was alive. And of course, there was statements made that it's possibly a prank call. I don't know. But I do know that if she is alive, I'd like to see her, you know, and I'd like to find her. And I feel that I'm speaking for my family and her family, her children, her husband. We'd all like to have her to come home. The authorities believe it is almost impossible that Mary Ann Perez might still be alive. However, Mary Ann's family clings to the fragile hope that David Courtney, who admits he was drunk at the time, did not succeed in his attempt to strangle her. He murdered several other people, and their bodies were found. So that gives us some hope that maybe he might have strangled her unconscious, thinking that she was dead, and threw her out. Maybe she uh, had amnesia or something like that, or maybe some of the brain cells were, you know, destroyed, and she can't remember who she is or what she was. And coming to sometime after the court and his left and just wandered out. Maybe she got up several hours later. Maybe there's a possibility, a slight possibility that she is somewhere out there. Did Mary Ann Perez miraculously survive the victim of amnesia? Or did David Courtney kill her? Courtney is currently serving a life sentence for the confessed murder of one of his other victims. One day I think that he did do it. Another day I think I don't know what happened to her. The fact is she's gone and has been gone for 15 years. Whether she's dead or alive, I don't know. We love her. We miss her and we want her back. That's all we want. And if, if, if she's gone, we still want a graveside to go put flowers on. For 15 long years, Mary Ann Perez's family has watched and waited. They are anxious for any news of Mary Ann, but they especially hope the woman who telephoned Sean Perez will call again. Mary Ann's family members want the caller to know how eager they are to cooperate. Each of them holds on to the hope, however illusory, that one day, Mary Ann will come home. Mary Ann Perez has reddish brown hair and blue eyes. She is five feet four inches tall, and at the time of her disappearance weighed 108 pounds. This is a computer age photograph to show how Mary Ann might look today at the age of 48. When we return, Authorities need your help to track down a clever con man who operates as a doctor. Cincinnati, Ohio, November 1986. A smooth-talking con artist lays the intricate groundwork for his latest scam. Mike Wills? Yes. Dr. John Anderson, how you doing? Well, nice to meet you, doctor. The target is Mike Wills, a veteran coin dealer. Like most of us, Mike thinks he would never fall prey to a con man. We've been talking about the maple leaf and the cooker ranch. He came across as a, a very polite, articulate man, and I had no reason at that time to doubt that he was anything other than what he told me he was, indeed a doctor. The corpulent con man who called himself Dr. John Anderson was interested in buying gold coins he suggested that Wills visit him at Children's Hospital and speak to his physician's investment group. I gotta be rushing on over to the hospital. I'm all the over trap the was now in place. Back with you. Nice meeting. Points plus. Two days later, what Dr. Anderson ordered $30,000 worth of gold coins. Mike Wills agreed to bring the coins to the hospital when he addressed Anderson's investment group. At 8 a.m. on November 26, 1986, Mike Dr. Wills arrived at Children's Hospital. 
Dr. Anderson had arranged to meet with Mike privately before Mike spoke to the physician's group. Dr. Kravitz, you have a visitor in the main lobby. The elevator Dr. door Kravitz. opens up and he's in the elevator. Hey, Mike, how you doing? How are you doing this morning? Pretty good. How about yourself? Good, good. Go ahead and press G for me, OK? Thank you. Take care of our little transaction. Yeah. We'll take care of our business as soon as we get downstairs. That's fine. Okay. But there were two other doctors on the elevator. He was not having conversation with the gentleman. See you later. But as we got off, he acknowledged them. There was nobody at all uh, in the hall, well, which didn't strike me that. as being odd because it was so early in the morning. OK, let's see what we have here. Doctor, I have two tubes of gold. Each has 25 pieces in it. OK. Dr. Anderson told Mike Wills he had access to a safe upstairs where he wanted to store the gold. He would return momentarily. You might want to have a seat, and uh, I'll be back with the check, OK? I sit there thinking back on it, what seems to be an eternity, but it's most probably more like five to six minutes. And my gold is gone, and Dr. Anderson is gone, and I have nothing to show for it. That was about all I could take, I guess. At that moment, I got up and I walked out of, the, out of this blind door, and now everybody is there. And there's five or six parents in the waiting room. Now there's a nurse at the nurse's station. Can I help you? Yes, I'm Mike Wills from a coin store here in Cincinnati. I need you to page a Dr. John Anderson for me. I just gave him a large amount of gold. There's no Dr. Anderson at this hospital. But there was a Dr. Anderson right down in the room down well, the hall I'm five sorry, minutes ago. Well, I'm sorry, I don't know of any Dr. Anderson on staff here. You may want to try upstairs. You can't page for me from here? It made sir. me feel extremely gullible that I could be duped so easily out of $30,000. I trusted a name tag. I trusted what this man told me uh, when he mentioned doctor. Maybe checks that I could have made, I didn't make, because this made everything seem right. Here you go, 10 gold maple leaves. Three years later, a Dr. Alfred Evans, notable for his girth, showed up at a coin shop in Albany, well, New York. Can you take a check? Sure. The doctor made several small purchases from coin dealer oh, Wendell Williams. Then a new twist. Williams received a $45,000 gold coin order from Dr. Evans via Federal Express. I decided that I wouldn't buy any gold, but I would see what he did when he came in. That Saturday, which was uh, November the 4th, when I was waiting on other customers, he came in in his jovial way and said hello to me. And the first words out of his mouth was, did you get my gold? I told him no. Seemed a little alarmed, but turned around and said, well, well then what do you have for me? And he said, what about that Rolex wristwatch that you had? And I said, well, I've got that for somebody else. But I'll get you some gold. OK, here you go, Doc. 80 ounces of gold maple leaves. How much is this? Well, they'll be 385.75 each. All right, I'll make you out a check for it. You know I'm going to have to hold the gold of that check clears. You know my checks are good. That might be, but When plan A didn't work, the bogus MD switched Look, strategies. Do, Just so this doesn't happen again, I'm going to go ahead and make out a blank check. You hold on to this, and that way, next time, we won't have to go through this. Sounds good. After Evans wrote the check, yeah. he started to chat with another customer and waited patiently for a new opportunity. Excuse me, fellas. I've got to take care of a customer. Sure. And, uh, Can I help you? With Wendell Williams occupied, the coast was clear. Plan B went off without a hitch. All right, I'll tell you what, if you can do me a favor, uh, I got to get running off to the hospital. So I'm going to leave these checks here. And if you can just do me a favor, make sure that he gets them. Sure. Take care of those for me. That's an MS-64. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you very much. As one might expect, Dr. Evans skipped town. His check for more than $30,000 was, of course, no good. In trying to track the activities of Dr. Evans, we've noticed that uh, he'll be in town for a couple of months to pull his scam, and then he'll be disappeared for a couple of months. We can't seem to find out what he's been doing during that period of time. Uh, it'll, there'll be gaps of anywhere from two to five months between cities. He could be doing anything from having a legitimate business, pulling another scam, or just plain vacationing somewhere. Authorities have uncovered these photographs of the elusive pseudo-doctor. 
They were taken in 1990 at a bank in Massachusetts. The authorities do not know the con man doctor's real name, but in addition to Anderson and Evans, he has also used the aliases Dr. John Miller, Dr. Michael Baker, and Dr. Brown. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.